talk is Jeffrey Grosenbach with Graphical Explanations. I used to run a company called Peep Code Screencasts. Now I work for a company called Plural Site Video Tutorials for developers, IT pros, and creative professionals. In the late 80s, uh, the founder of the TED conference wrote a book called Information Anxiety, where he talked about the fact that information on its own is no longer a value. It's not, no longer something we'll, we are willing to pay for. I remember when my family bought the World Book Encyclopedia, and you know, you pay $1,000 because there's just so much information in there. But now we have tons of information available to us on the internet, and his point was that we are willing to pay for someone to filter that information for us and teach us only the things that we really need to know. And he actually wrote the book itself with this in mind. He made it so that it could be read at different levels or different levels of intention. For example, if you had a very short amount of time, you could just skim the table of contents and you would actually learn something. It was written so that you could learn just from the table of contents. Or if you had more time, you could just flip through the entire book. I think it's 350 pages or something and, and you could learn by flipping through it. Or if you had plenty of time, then you could read and study the entire book and, and read every word, and of course you could learn a lot from that. So I realize this is actually the way we read lots of, of different documents of all kinds. Uh, the New Yorker magazine is, is famous for people receiving it and immediately just reading all the cartoons and not reading all these serious, uh, you know, semi-academic articles there. Uh, same thing when I receive any magazine, I'll just flip through the whole thing. So I thought, is, could we apply this to documentation? I actually had a blog for about two years where we had full control over the HTML and CSS of every post and we would, we would design each post. So that If you didn't want to read all the text, you could just go down and look at, at some graphics that would explain things. So for example, here you might be able to just quickly see that on Mac OS X you could delete the entire previous word by hitting option delete. And now I use this like t 10 times every day. Or if you wanted to, you could read the entire, entire post and, and learn about that. So for me, I want to talk about graphics and using graphics in your documentation because in addition to being a great explanatory tool and ex connecting with a, a way that many people like to learn, it also helps your documentation to be consumed at different uh, levels of attention or amount of time. Now, there are many people who go into uh, quite a lot of detail about how to make graphics and how to explain things. I use that usually, I love conferences that have 20 minute talks because you get to hear from a dozen different speakers and, and it's uh, great to just have these concise talks. But when I was starting to prepare this, I felt like, wow, this is an, a topic I'm so excited about. I want to talk about this for like four hours. Uh, so if you want to read about this for many, many hours, you could look at the works of Edward Tufte, who has four uh, really good books on this. He does a workshop actually tomorrow in uh, San Jose, I believe. He's doing a workshop with Mike Bostock of the D3 Graphics Library and Brett Victor, who talks a lot about the future of programming and, and graphics. Uh, so Ed Edward Tufte has a lot to, to say in detail about graphics. Another book that I just love, I've worn this uh, dog-eared, is uh, Information Dashboard Design by Stephen Few. Very practical. If you get this book and read nothing else, read chapter four where he talks about the different ways that things can be presented graphically and how that connects with our brain or how that does not connect with our brain and, and um, di different ways to use color, shape, position, length of lines, all these kinds of things. But briefly, I'd like to talk about some of the ways that I've used graphics in, the, uh, in the, the teaching or the documentation that I've done. And the first and easiest way, I think, is with type. I, for a long time, have been interested in type and typography. My mother was a lot into calligraphy. And for a long time, I just thought this is just kind of a, a side hobby. And then I realized type is the way that we communicate. It's, uh, it's just everywhere. And the more you learn how to use type well, the better you're going to be able to, to communicate. So is there anything we can learn just from type? 
Well, when the web started, it wasn't really designed as a graphical medium, and even now many of our documentation systems don't treat the web browser as this graphical thing. So many of the things that the type designers and graphic designers had learned for hundreds of years didn't come along with the web. But now we have much more power with CSS3 and web fonts and all these kinds of things to use some of these um, techniques. And what are some of those? Well, the pull quote, where you have a block of text and then you have a big highlight of something that's really important to, th to think about. Again, this can be consumed in different ways. Somebody just scanning through your documentation, their eye is going to be led to these pull quotes and they're going to be able to get something out of that even if they don't read every word of the entire documentation. Another is just the, the title and the subtitle. Often we are pretty restricted in the title of a document or even ch a chapter where you get, a, you know, four to six words to communicate what this chapter is about. But with a subtitle, you can go into a little bit more detail. And again, people can get a good idea of, of what's going on with a subtitle. Color is very important. Uh, I loved in Mo's presentation earlier today, looking at his meeting notes. How did he improve the notes? He highlighted in red the very important things that people needed to say. Now, for me, I'm a developer. I work a lot with developer, uh, teaching developers, and when we are writing code, we really like editors that highlight these different words in code or, or in CSS for us. Anytime you can do that in your documentation is, uh, is going to help people read it better and, uh, and uh, is something that you can easily do even if you're not an illustrator. You can take advantage of the power of, of color to make, uh, make text and, and code more readable. Sometimes this is a little bit difficult. Um, you know, the, the blog of our, my, the company I'm with right now, we're working to try to get better code snippets even in our blog post, which sometimes takes a little bit of research and a little bit of doing to make that just smooth and, and work for everybody who wants to contribute. Depending on the resources you have or the control you have over your documentation system, you might want to check out this great Python tool called Pigments, which can handle almost any kind of source code in the world and give you all different kinds of formats. If it's HTML, CSS, or LaTeX, or rich text format, and, um, and then you can plug that into any other documentation system. Or if it's something like a presentation like this, uh, there's a, a plugin for the Sublime text editor called Sublime Highlight that lets you just copy rich text right from the text editor and then paste that, let's say, into, into Keynote or presentation software or any, you could even paste it into a word processor that can handle um, any kind of rich text and that's a way to, great way to get code in color. Beyond that, we have a huge catalog of ways that people communicate textually and things that we're aware of when we see them out in the world. Uh, you know, we already saw the, the, the red octagonal stop sign. Or if you see a format like this, well, we recognize that as kind of a warning of some kind. And you can use these typographic memes to then communicate in a way that this going to connect with people. The next thing I love as far as making your documentation more graphical is to involve some kind of icons. It's an easy way to build different kinds of explanations and show a flow of ideas or, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, an analogy or different, uh, the different kind of people or roles involved without having to be an illustrator or subcontract something out to an illustrator. Early on, this meant clip art, but in the last couple of years, we have a huge number of great icon sets available that are very usable in desktop software or the web and uh, makes it, this a lot easier. One of my favorites is called Symbol Set or Symbolicons. Uh, either of those, symbolset.com or symbolicons.com. Uh, what it basically does is you can use this as a font and if you type a word in this font, it automatically turns into a picture of whatever that thing is. 
Now you, you're limited to about 400 different words that it understands, but uh, a very easy way to then put, uh, put different icons of different sizes into, your, um, into any kind of graphics you want to create. And they are uh, you know, fully scalable, so you can have it be very tiny, or you can have it fill the entire page, and it's going to look fantastic. You can also change the color. Here I have a, a variety of colors that I did by just changing the color of the font. And if you want to get tricky, you can even combine things. Here I needed a helicopter, but it didn't have a helicopter. So I took a UFO and a paddle, and I put that all together, and now I have a helicopter. So beyond that, to me, the, the power of graphics is not just that we're making something graphical and, and suddenly you have a picture on the screen, but it's because there's a powerful explanation behind it, and it helps to communicate that explanation to the people who are reading or, or consuming the documentation. And to me, it doesn't matter if you're writing API documentation or getting started documentation or a full step-by-step -step tutorial. The, the, uh, the weight of the explanation to me is what matters. After a couple of years of, do, of producing documentation uh, daily, I realized that there were a lot of different explanatory tools I use that, uh, that I like to, to reach for just incidentally, but listing these out helped me to kind of think of these as part of my toolbox of, of ways to explain things. So briefly, you can see a number up there, bad and good. Again, Mo used the, this earlier uh, today. Here's some bad meeting notes, and then here were some good meeting notes. And that connection is a really powerful one in our brain to see the contrast and see how one is better than the other. And to me, using these explanatory tools and then translating them into graphics is, is uh, definitely a great way to go. So f just looking at a few of these briefly, the bad and good explanatory tool, I like to pull from just all kinds of uh, learning resources. I happen to be a cyclist, and this is a video, a little snippet from a video from a guy, Jeremy Powers, talking about the amount of air pressure you put in your tires if you're going to ride this, this uh, bike sport called cyclocross, which happens in dirt and mud. And he uses kind of a Goldilocks principle where he talks about too little, too much, and then just right. So let's listen to this. Now we're going to show you what too much pressure, not enough pressure, and just the right amount of pressure looks like. This set of tires is overinflated, making the contact patch almost non-existent. Look closely to notice how the tires are sliding out and breaking loose. They have zero traction in this corner. These tires were inflated to 45 PSI. These tires are underinflated. When this happens while you're riding, you'll hear what some riders call a burp. Because the tires don't have enough pressure, they lose shape and deform to the point where you're riding on the rim. As you can see in my rear tire here. In this state, you have no contact patch or traction. These tires were inflated to 18 PSI. This is what a perfect tire pressure should look like. Look closely at how the tire sidewalls are moving and how the tire is forming to the ground. At the apex of the turn, the rear tire starts to deform just slightly. To me, this is a moving piece of art. At the correct tire pressure, the tire has a massive contact patch and perfect traction. This tire is inflated to 24 PSI. So I love that example, even if you don't work in video or have high-speed video cameras or a professional bike racer to go uh, perform for your documentation, the way he used this concept of, of, of bad versus good and demonstrated that I think is, is very powerful. I love, too, how involved he is in this explanation. And at one point, he's just kind of admiring this work of art, of, of poetry, of, of how these tires look, and is very involved into it. If we're doing this just statically, 
it's great to identify the bad example and the good example. Now, we can use color. Often, the color red is associated with something you should not do or, or stop doing, whereas green is, is something that's good. Um, and here, these are actually symbolicons right there that I've used. I always try to identify, when I'm using this technique, you know, always identify the bad version. I've read books or read uh, examples where there will be a bad snippet of code, and yet it's not identified that until you've read a f little bit further in the paragraphs, and then you realize that's something you should not be doing. So using this to, to graphically identify the, the bad version and the good version is a great explanatory tool. Before and after is another very powerful one. Uh, here's an architectural photographer named Mike Kelly. Does an amazing uh, video for this site called F Stoppers about how to do some really complicated architectural photography. And he uses the before and after example. Here's a very beautiful house, but it's kind of in the shadows and the sky isn't very interesting. You can't see very much. And then he shows you the after where the house has just these glowing lights out of the windows and he's even like used flashes to paint the sagebrush in front of the house and suddenly you're just gripped by the, the uh, improvement of this photo at, over the first one and then you're very motivated to watch this six hour uh, docu you know, video documentary about how he went through a hundred different photographs and combined these all in Photoshop to make these. Uh, to me, the, this before and after is, is very compelling. When we're writing documentation or de delivering documentation, I think a big part of that is just showing people from the outset, here's what you're going to end up with. If you're building a, a uh, demo project to learn a piece of software, well, here's what it's going to look like when we're completely done. Or you can show by, side by side. Here's the code that we're going to write, and here's the result. Maybe we have some HTML, and then on the other side, we have the what that HTML is going to look like in the browser. Another explanatory tool I love is, is uh, good, better, and best. And I really like just contrasting things side by side. Here, this was a presentation about how early, in the early web, we would just serve static files directly, but then later we have, uh, when a URL is accessed, we'll go through maybe a, some kind of server and a program runs, and then it generates a more complex web page for us. This progression, good, better, and best, is kind of a variation on that bad and good that's, that's really powerful. And then just a few more analogies can be extremely powerful. This was from a video I did talking about uh, Ruby event machine, which is ther this very kind of complex and difficult to en understand software that, you know, what it does is, is fairly abstract of how it allows you to run multiple bits of code all at the same time. And we realized that this could be explained by a person with water balloons who then shared a bunch of water balloons with his, their friends who then could throw those water balloons all at the same time and see them explode. And again, I'm not an illustrator, but we were able to use a couple of a couple icons and throw a bow tie on one of them and see how these all fit together to then explain this technical concept. We used that analogy further for some of these other uh, software concepts we were trying to explain. For example, sending a message, which was a water balloon going down a gutter and arriving to all the friends. So wrapping up then, Timeline is another, I think, a, a powerful way to communicate and uh, fits well into graphical presentation. Sometimes the best way to explain something is to tell the story of how it got there. Here was an explanation of some, some issues around JavaScript, and it was great to just start at the beginning, mark the years, and then talk about the different things that were happening throughout those different years. So to me, Teaching and documentation is difficult because learning is difficult. It's, it's difficult to learn these things. Anything we can do to help explain in different ways, help people consume con our uh, content at different levels, I think is, is really worthwhile and is, is going to help them. And if you like talking about this even more, at 4 p.m. downstairs, we're going to have an open space session about design and UX of documentation. and. Uh, of course, at Pluralsight, we're always looking for great authors, so uh, 
love to talk to you at any time if, if you're interested in that. Thank you.